Good afternoon. My name is Mark Garrigus. I, along with Cliff Gardner, represent Lyle and Eric Menendez. I also have here today Alex Kazarian, Sitara Kasim is somewhere, and Tina Glavian, the, who have been working for the last 18 months in order to get a release for Lyle and Eric Menendez. A couple of weeks ago, uh, and so that you understand the background of it, back in May, we filed a writ of habeas corpus. A judge in this courthouse, Judge William Ryan, issued what's called a informal request for a reply. That informal request for a reply was to ask the DA to respond to the allegations of new evidence. Part of the two prongs of new evidence were number one, a letter that was found at Marta Kano's house that was a letter written by Eric fully eight months before the killings to his cousin Andy. His cousin Andy testified at the trial. However, in the second trial was demeaned as making this up or was not true. This letter now shows or corroborates that Andy was telling the truth. The letter describes the abuse. The letter, I believe, was released at least temporarily by the DA's office. And anybody who wants it, we can release that as well. The other pillar of the uh, writ of habeas corpus was a declaration by Roy Rosello. The declaration by Roy Rosello is incredibly important for a number of reasons. Number one, Roy Rosello, who was a member or a then member of the band Menudo, was and took great courage at Nuri's uh, finding him and talking to him to sign a declaration that said that he too was assaulted by um, the, uh, the father and not only assaulted, but it happened at the house. The reason that's important is that it corroborates what was testified to in trial number one, that it corroborates the fact that the safe place that Jose thought he had was in the house. It corroborates what the family members said was the very uncomfortable rule in that house that you could got, not go down the hallway if Jose was with one of the boys. That was the, the, the ground upon which he prayed. We have those two items. Now, there is a separate track. About three months ago, we sent a petition, and mind you, the DA's office, there's been those who have said, well, this is election uh, nearing, blah, blah, blah. We filed this, and the DA has been, Mr. Gascon's office, has been engaged with us productively, strongly, for well over a year. Joan, who you will hear from in about five minutes, we actually, because of her young age, she turns 93 next month, we had a, what's a very rare thing done back in December, which is called a conditional examination. It's a deposition in a criminal case to preserve her testimony. She was there with her lawyer, Brian Friedman, who represents the family. And what we are also on a parallel track doing is asking and have been asking the DA to look at the work they have done and resentence them, to support the resentencing. Now, when I say the work they have done, Lyle and Eric have started, mind you, since 2005, up until the time that Judge Ryan issued the request for an informal reply, have had no hope of ever getting out. Since 2005, they had exhausted all legal remedies. They had resigned themselves to being in prison for the rest of their lives. You could take two, tra two tracks on that. You could either just become a hardcore, um, irreconcilable um, recidivist, or you could do what they've done, which is create programs, counsel people, develop amazing programs, mentoring people, go to college, get degrees. Lyle, in fact, graduated from the first ever class in June. I watched it 
of a combination of UCI along with the Department of Corrections, the first class, uh, Mr. Friedman and I were there, of 22 prisoners who got their BA degree while in prison, and a, a bunch of them, life without parole. So there is an idea that there is redemption. There is an idea with their green space project of rehabilitation. I will tell you in 40, over 40 years of doing this, I have never seen the amazing exemplary rehabilitation and mitigation evidence that we have now presented to the DA's office. We're gonna hear from the family today briefly, and I will tell you, I'll give you kind of a coming attraction. I will start with Anna Maria. She will tell you exactly the genealogy. We have over 20 relatives, both Kitty and Jose's sides of the family. This is virtually unprecedented in my practice, and I would uh, dare say it anywhere, that 20 family members on both sides, victims, constitutional victims under Marcy's law, are here to urge the DA to resentence. When after they're speaking, finish speaking to you today, we will then, Mr. Friedman will take them across the street to the Hall of Justice and they will go through what, what Gascon does uh, with, in resentencing and they will meet with the resentencing unit. They will, under the California Constitution, Marcy's Law, they will voice their opinion on why they believe it's time that these gentlemen come home that they've spent over 35 years, and I've said it once, I've said it twice, if they were the Menendez sisters, they would not be in custody. We have evolved, it's time, and without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Anna Maria, who's gonna come up and speak. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. My name is Anna Maria Baralt. I am the niece of Jose Menendez. I stand before you today, not just as a member of the Menendez family, but as someone who believes in truth, justice, and healing. Before I get started, I just wanna say that I know this is an election season, but for us, this is not a political issue. This is about truth, justice, and healing. On behalf of our whole family, it is my honor to formally introduce our new coalition, Justice for Eric and Lyle. Like so many others, I struggled to process the events of that fateful August day and the loss that I felt. Over time, it became clear that there were two other victims there on that day, my cousins Lyle and Eric. Lyle and Eric would continue to be victimized. They would be victims of a system that wouldn't hear them. And they would be victims of a culture that was not ready to listen. They would be mocked. They would be called cold-blooded killers left to rot in jail and denied any hope of redemption. If Lyle and Eric's case were heard today, with the understanding we now have about abuse and PTSD, there is no doubt in my mind that their sentencing would have been very different. And yet, despite their circumstances, they have chosen a life of light. Without hope of release, they persevered. They have sought to better themselves, and serve as a support and inspirations for survivors all over the world. Their continued incarceration serves no rehabilitative purpose. It's time to recognize the injustice they've suffered and allow them the second chance they deserve. Now here we are, both sides of the family united, sharing a new bond of hope. Hope that with the reexamination of their case, a new outcome will be reached. Hope that this 34-year nightmare will end and that we will be reunited as a family. I am here to ask the district attorney's office to take into account the full picture, the truth that was hidden for so long. Lyle and Eric deserve a chance to heal, and our family deserves a chance to heal with them. Please join us. Visit www.justiceforericandlyle.org and sign our petition. And if you'll indulge me, I have two more statements to read. The first is from my mother, 85 years old, Terry Baralt, the sister of Jose Menendez. She can't be with us today due to health challenges, but she sent me this. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person to support my nephews, Lyle and Eric. I begin chemo soon and my doctor says no flights. 
I need to be strong. I wish to make it clear that I stand firmly with this family. I am Lyle's godmother, and I love them both very, very much. My nephews have spent three decades in prison helping others. I have seen great growth in them. Even the law enforcement supervisors and corrections have written letters to the court asking for their resentencing and release. Millions across this country agree. I implore the district attorney's office to end our prolonged suffering and release Lyle and Eric back to our family. 35 years is such a long time. My prayer is that I live long enough to see my nephews again and to hug them once more. I have another statement, and this is written uh, by a family member of Marta Cano and Andy Cano, that Andy, the one to whom the letter was written. This is written by one of Marta's children. Thank you for giving our family the opportunity to express our thoughts during this pivotal time in Lyle and Eric's case. Our family's tragedy has always been very public and has been extensively covered by many media platforms. Marta and Andy Cano would have wanted to speak today, but unfortunately they are both unable to do so. Marta is in memory, memory care, but she spent decades supporting Lyle and Eric Sadly, we lost Andy shortly before his 30th birthday, and we miss him every day. Both Marta and Andy deeply loved Lyle and Eric. They both believed in justice, but they also believed in a second chances and forgiveness. It has been 35 years since this happened, and we feel enough peasant penance has been paid. It is time for them to be released and for all of us to move on and continue healing as a family. Again, if you want to help, Please join us at justiceforlyleanderic.org and sign our petition. With that, I'm going to be followed by several members of the Anderson family. First will be Alan Anderson. He's the nephew of Kitty Menendez. Of Kitty Menendez, sorry. Of Ki yeah, of Kitty Menendez. Mm -hmm. And the second will be Karen, the niece of Kitty Menendez. Um, but first, Joan Vandermillen, sister of Kitty Menendez. Please join us. Soldiers, thank you. Come right here, Jimmy. Not very much space for paper, is there? Do you want the glasses on? No, they're not even mine, but yes. <laughs> okay. I hope they match the top. Okay. Please know that I'm nervous and full of emotions. I never thought this day would come. I am Kitty's sister. I stand here today with a heavy heart and also with hope and justice and understanding. We have received such an outpouring support in recent weeks, which led us to launch this formal initiative. For many years, I struggled with terms, to terms with what happened to my sister's family. It was a nightmare none of us could have imagined. But as details of Lyle and Eric's abuse came to light, it became clear that their actions, while tragic, were the desperate response of two boys trying to survive the unspeakable cruel of their father. As their aunt, I had no idea of the extent of the abuse they suffered at the hands of my brother-in-law. None of us did. But book it, looking back, I can see the fear and tension that their father had instilled on them. They were just children, children who could have been protected and were instead brutalized in the most horrific ways. The truth is, Lyle and Eric were failed by the very people who should have protected them, by their parents, by the system, by society at large. When they stood trial, the whole world was ready to believe that the boys could be raped. Was not ready, excuse me, not ready. The whole world was not ready to believe boys could be raped. 
or that young men could be victims of sexual violence. Today we know better. We know that abuse has long-lasting effects and victims of trauma sometimes act in ways that are very difficult to understand. In the years since their conviction, society's understanding of sexual abuse and its psychological impact has grown significantly. We understand that a person doesn't need to fit a specific mold, whether it's gender or socioeconomic status in order to experience abuse. In their case, if it were tried today, the evidence of their father's abuse would not only be admitted in court, it would provide essential context for why they acted as they did. No jury today would issue a, such a harsh presence, sentence without taking their trauma into account. Lyle and Eric have already paid a heavy price, discarded by a system that failed to recognize their pain. They have grown, they have changed, and they have become better men despite everything that they've been through. It's time to give them the opportunity to live the rest of their lives free from the shadow of their past. While I recognize it is election season, this isn't about us or about the politics. It's about finding the truth, delivering justice, creating space for healing. I want to thank everyone who has reached out by our family, to our family in recent days and weeks, asking how they can help. Today we have an answer. Please sign our petition at www.justiceforericandlyle.org and urge urged the district attorney's office, no matter who holds the DA position, to consider all the evidence, both old and new, and to bring together justice for the family. And thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry I'm so nervous I can't help it. Next, we have Alan Anderson, nephew of Kitty Menendez. Hello, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Hello, my name is Brian A. Anderson, Jr. I am the Kitty of Menendez. Kitty Menendez. I'm Kitty of Menendez's nephew. I am proud to be a member of this family and to help spearhead this formal effort to organize and galvanize all the support we have received. Together, I believe we can finally bring justice for my cousins Lyle and Eric. I've known Lyle and Eric my whole life. I can tell you without a doubt that they are not the villains they've been portrayed as. They were boys, young, scared, and abused by their father in ways no child should ever experience. You, the media, focused so much on their actions, but they never were told, they never were able to tell the full story of their abuse that drove them to such desperate measures. When I think about the pain and suffering they endured, it breaks my heart to know that the system failed them so profoundly. They tried to protect themselves the only way they knew how. But instead of being seen as victims, they were vilified. Their father's abuse was dismissed, their trauma ignored, and their truth mocked by millions. Today, we know the trauma, we know that trauma can lead to actions that, while difficult to understand, are rooted in survival. Lyle and Eric acted out of fear, but the jury never heard the full story. If their trial were held today, their father's abuse would be front and center in their defense, and I believe the outcome would be very different. Lyle and Eric are not the same people they were 35 years ago. They've shown that they are more than their past. 
They are survivors and deserve a chance to rebuild their lives. They are no longer a threat to society. Please do not misconstrue this to be political. Justice should prevail and transcend politics. I am asking the district attorney's office, regardless of who the DA is or becomes, to reconsider their case with the knowledge we now have about their abuse. Lyle and Eric deserve a second chance, a chance to heal, a chance to be free, and to live the rest of their lives without the, sh without the shadow of their past hanging over them. I firmly believe that if they were to come to my house, knock on my door, I would answer that door, I would welcome them in with huge hugs, my wife would make them a dinner, and I'd give them a pillow and a place to sleep. Thank you for being here today supporting Justice for Lyle and Eric. Please go to our website, learn the truth about their story, and sign our petition. Thank you. Please welcome Karen Vandermullen, niece of Kitty Menendez. Good afternoon. There's a lot of you, and I'm very nervous. Um, my name is Karen Vandermolen Copley. I am Kitty Menendez's niece, and I'm here today speaking out because I have believed for many years that the truth needs to be known about what really happened to my cousins, Lyle and Eric. From the beginning, I believed Lyle and Eric were victims of their father's abuse. I grew up knowing and feeling something wasn't right. The feeling in their house and the father-son interactions were just off. But it was not until the first trial that the full horror of what they had to live through came to light. My sister, Diane, had evidence of their abuse. That was not even allowed to be presented at the trial. I cannot help but think of how things would be different if the world had known the truth back then, or if they had been the Menendez sisters Adults of abuse have difficulty getting out of their situations, and yet these were two young boys who were never allowed to make decisions on their own. They lived in constant fear and were unable to make any other decisions than the sexual violence that they were taught at the very hands of people who were supposed to love and protect them. Their sometimes misunderstood behaviors were cries for help that many of us wished we had realized and responded to far sooner. What happened is tragic, but I forgive my cousins. I have forgiven them forever because I know they were acting out of fear and desperation. These were children children, just six and eight years old, who didn't understand their own bodies. No child should ever have to endure that kind of pain. This abuse trapped them. It was painful and it terrified them. Their father's abuse shattered their lives and the family's lives and the courts failed them, failed to recognize their trauma compounding this tragedy. We live in a time now where we understand how abuse can shape a person's actions, male or female. We live in a time now where we understand what trauma does to the brain development of a child. If Lyle and Eric's trial happened today, the outcome would be drastically different. The evidence of their father's abuse would have been a central part of their defense and it's very likely they would not have received such harsh sentences. Lyle and Eric have spent most of their lives in prison paying for their actions. During that time, they have become supporters and advocates for children 
who have suffered sexual violence. I believe they have suffered enough. I ask the district attorneys to take into account the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I believe they have paid for their crimes and we as a family have all suffered enough. We are here for them and ready to support Eric and Lyle after released. This is a time for truth and justice and the time for the path to healing. It is time, time for Eric and Lyle to come home. We are here for them. Please visit our website and sign our petition. We would love nothing more than for our mom to be able to wrap her arms around Eric and Lyle outside prison walls before she is unable to do so. Thank you. Thank you all. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Friedman, and I represent the extended family members of the Menendez family. Um, first of all, the family is gathered here in support and really thanks everyone for coming out and for being here and, and, and for supporting one message, which is, you know, this shouldn't happen again. And this needs to stop now. And that what needs to happen is the consideration of second chances, the consideration of the abuse and changing what we know in our society to be wrong and we know in our society to give people second chances. The families here united. Eric and Lyle have been through so much in 35 years, but these family members have been through so much 35 years. They're gonna go across the street now, they're gonna meet with the DA's office, they're gonna exercise their constitutional rights under Marcy's laws to be heard, and they would respect and, and, and ask if they could make that journey peacefully so that they can share their truth, desires, and honesty with the DA's office. Um, and again, you know, thank you for the support and for being here. And Mark Garagos, thank you. As Brian said, if we can let, especially um, Joe, get across, I'll answer some questions in about two minutes, if that works, yes. Yeah, I'll speak to that in just one minute. Uh, if you wait just two minutes, we have stuff to talk about there. Unless you want to say something about this. You wait until you go across.
victim is get a say. So the, what we did is the DA's office, what they heard that we were doing the press conference, request or extended the invitation for the family to come over and um, hear about Marcy's Law, to hear about exactly what their feelings are. I will tell you, and I said it before, Chef, one, two. Uh, that Chef, one, two. the DA's office, for 18 months ago, has taken this very seriously. And I say that because there are times, whether it's high profile, low profile, that I don't get the feeling that we're being heard. Uh, I get the feeling that we are being heard. I get the feeling that there is genuine specific Sneak away. The DA has mentioned his remarks that there is a division in the office. I understand that. I get that. But I don't think that there should be any division when you've got a united front of this many family members. And I know somebody had asked me about one of the um, one of the family members. I would just say I don't want to cast dispersions on anyone. All I will say is. Think about your own family. Do you think you could get almost unanimous support out of your own family and extended relatives for anything you do? So I'd leave it at that. Marcus Gascon made an Well, I I think interestingly, and I don't know how you measure something like this, but I have been, you know, obviously I was practicing when this trial took place. I remember in 1994 representing a woman in Pomona, and we used the battered woman syndrome, and she got a voluntary manslaughter, she got probation. And I remember at the time being struck by the idea, and I've confirmed it now in the transcripts of their second trial, struck by the idea that the DA's office on the second trial took the position, and it may not have been wrong at the time, that the battered woman syndrome, that something that diminishes your intent, did not apply to child abuse. And that was on the record, and that's what the judge ruled. So how do I think, what, or how is this evolved? First of all, the younger generation, I hate to say that, makes me seem old, but they clearly, there has been a movement. I think that what happened is that when the Ryan Murphy series came out, it was such a caricature of them that the pendulum swing, that backlash, actually created a focus on it. And people then took a look. I know that I've seen some of those um, videos of the first trial that was televised where the DA's office was taking the position that men could not be raped, they don't have the equipment. And you've seen all kinds of arguments along those lines. That is unfathomable in today's age to people who weren't alive back then. So I think that evolution has been, uh, frankly, uh, seismic. Wasn't there a lousy evolution? Sorry, what do Lyle and Harris think about this communication? I think one of the reasons that we mentioned early on in that the family has said it, they had absolutely no hope after 05. So after 2005, they didn't believe, they thought they were going to spend the rest of their life in prison. And they had resigned themselves to it. And all of the programs, I invite anybody to take a look at what's called the Green Space Program that they have, the Green Space Program that they have created down there, that's based on the Norwegian model, that is something that they have done in order to in, in order to reacclimate prisoners who are being released. I look at both the external programs that they've done and the introspection and work they've done on themselves. I use the term cautiously optimistic. I mean there is an irony that DA politics played a role in their conviction. Well, look, I've, I've said it before, and Joan, who you saw, her birthday is November, I want to say the 26th, she turns 93. Nothing she'd like more than to have them home for Thanksgiving. What do you think of the two 
That's what the uh, question was. What do you say to the people who say they acted out of greed? I have two responses to that. Number one, that's why the letter that predates the killing from Eric to Andy is so important. Number one, it corroborates that it was happening before. Number two, people forget this probably before you were born. They went to the grand jury. The DA's office went to the grand jury on the financial motive theory. The grand jury, which will indict anybody on anything, the grand jury rejected that theory. So that is another one of the urban legends. Mark, has the DA made any overtures to meet with Lyle and Eric, and have you encouraged him to do so? Well, the, I don't think that the protocol in the DA's office is anything but what we're doing today. The protocol today is that you meet with the resentencing unit, you get informed of Marcy's law, and you go from there. I don't know. I I will tell you. I've represented. Excuse me for one second. Okay. So I don't know that there, other than one-offs, there's always going to be one-offs. I mean, it's the criminal justice system. It was a polarizing case. Remember, part of what happened was back in the 90s, they become a caricature. They were parodied on Saturday Night Live. I would venture to say that would not happen today. So I, you know, there's, I, you know, we're, we're, it's America. There's people with diverse opinions. I just would reiterate, there were two juries in trial number one, back in the 90s, two juries, one for Eric, one for Lyle, 24 jurors who deliberated, half of them voted not guilty on murder. Half. Well, I've, I've said before that the Menudo Declaration by Roy Rosello is important. Uh, but you combine it with, by the way, that is so that you can separate the mental gymnastics. Part of this is to overturn the conviction. The other part is that I think is unassailable, even to your question, to anybody who, who says, well, they shouldn't get out. The law in California is crystal clear. Resentencing, they qualify under the resentencing laws on every single factor. It's almost, I hate to say that anything's a slam dunk in the criminal law, but under the resentencing laws in California, they clearly qualify. We filed originally for the conviction to be overturned. That's what a writ of habeas corpus is. The other component of this is a resentencing. So it's two tracks. You can pause the habeas while you consider the resentencing. So it's walking and chewing gum at the same time. What? If, there, if the habeas would be granted, you would get a new trial. If they are resentenced, the judge under California law has the ability to recall the sentence and sentence them to a wide range of options. Well, and that's because the resentencing is what I understand. If he feels, oh, they've been rehabilitated, they're no longer a threat to society, they've paid their debt to society, they would qualify under the resentencing law. Correct. And in fact, I will also tell you, and we may release it tomorrow, part of the mitigation package that we presented to the DA are letters from correctional officers, high-ranking correctional officers, who attest to the phenomenal rehabilitation. We have a number of correctional officers who have actually said, if released, they should be released, and that they would welcome them as neighbors in their neighborhood. I'm going to take, I'm going to take two more questions because I want to get over there to meet with the DA as well. What? I, you know, I won't speak to whether they have a plan. I just think that in order to get through each day, that you've got to just ground yourself. It's a long, it's a long road from life without for almost 17 years to have been hopeful. So that's I kind of want. One last question.
somebody, some wag, I don't know who it was, I could give him credit, said about Ryan Murphy that, of course, he's going to take credit. I didn't say it, so I don't know the man. Anyway. So, All right, you guys, thank you. If you have any other questions, you can email me at holly underscore baird at yergos.com. Yes, yes. And we will be sending out a press release along with a link to the press conference as well, and it will be in Spanish. Correct, yes. Can we get the mural photos from the, their project? No, no, mural photos. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great to show what they're doing. Check, remember that. Okay. One second, remind, say it again. Correct. 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 Correct.